Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. My name is Lisa Melandri. I'm the executive director here at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. And we are thrilled and delighted to be able to present this panel this morning as a chance to really learn more about the wonderful exhibition that we have on view, Basquiat Before Basquiat, East 12th Street, 1979 to 1980. I'd like to introduce Nora Abrams, who is the curator and director of planning at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver. Uh, she is the curator of this exhibition and originated this exhibition, so we feel very honored and privileged to be able to be a venue for this extraordinary material. And I'm gonna pass it directly on to her so that she can take you through and we can hear all the right stories. So thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you, Nora. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Can you all hear me OK? No? OK. Uh, I will adjust this. Is that better? OK, well, I can't believe that all of you are here today. We are so thrilled to be able to share a little more insight into uh, the extraordinary life and work of the artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. And I will not do much of the talking. I am going to mostly leave it to the three people who share this stage with me. To my left, Alexis Adler, from whom we have this extraordinary exhibition to view. Yeah. <laughs> Alexis lived with Jean uh, from 1979 to 1980 in a small walk-up apartment on East 12th Street. And um, it is through her perseverance, her courage, her grit, her conviction that all this material is available for us and is in as great a condition as it is in. So Alexis, Alexis is also a world-renowned embryologist, but that part probably won't play as well into <laughs> this conversation. Um, to her left is the musician, performer, actor, writer, amazing woman, Felice Rosser, uh, with whom Alexis and Jean first lived, uh, also in the East Village in the late 70s. And Felice, we are so thrilled to have you as part of this conversation. And at the farthest left, the scholar, critic, writer, downtown scene aficionado, Carlo McCormick, who has written extensively on art and culture, music, literature, everything, particularly from this era and certainly onward through today. Um, and his insights and experiences as to the kind of broader cultural context in which all of this work was made will, I think, help us to really connect with that era today. And that's really the goal of this conversation, is to help bring this kind of, this moment to life anew. So uh, behind us, you will see um, kind of floating through just examples of works uh, from the exhibition, just to continue to remind you of what we're, what we're talking about. But we probably won't dwell on specific works too, uh, too deeply. So I'm just going to kick it off, you guys. And uh, I want to talk first about, um, you know, the exhibition is kind of a little episode, if you will, about what unfolded in this apartment in the East Village over the course of a year. And it's also, I think, very much about what was unfolding in the streets of the neighborhood where you lived. Uh, and I was hoping that you could kind of kick us off with giving us a little flavor of the context of that neighborhood, the music scene, the kind of the literature scene, the art scene, the fashion scene, kind of because it was all so kind of inter, interwoven, um, if you could kind of pull out for us what it was like just l being a part of the East Village at that time. Who? Who uh, it's for all of you. Okay. So it was a very dynamic place, yet very desolate place, the East Village. And um, 
a lot of the materials that you'll see that Jean was using at the time, which was a time before he'd had, had a proper studio. So he was just a young artist looking for his next, you know, really place. And uh, we were part of the East Village, and the East Village was a, was a scene, and it was like a dynamic scene, and we were all part of it, and we would... What made it so dynamic? The freaks. On that note. You want to say something, please? You have okay. Say well, I mean, uh, it, uh, the things I, I mean, beyond the fact that it was really derelict and it had gone through this huge white flight and it had a lot of abandonment, there was a lot there, actually. Um, and I always think that there were kind of two East Village because there were people who'd been living there for generations. And this was also kind of the, uh, uh, it's sort of the melting pot. This is, you know, if, if uh, America can perpetrate that mythology still in this uh, age of xenophobia, this is where everyone was coming for, you know, off of Ellis Island. It was the immigrant community. So I felt it was like really rich with all these other histories. And, and, and when you get so, uh, many artists, not just Jean-Michel, but grabbing stuff off the street and making things with it, it was like, this, this beautiful uh, kind of dialogue with, with, with this history. And there were so many different scenes. It was like, a, you know, like we had a huge uh, drag queen scene. We had like all these different like things that don't, no, don't make everyone's perfect idea of what the East Village was. It was a, a lot of different people and that was all really connected. And then, uh, there, there's a lot of, like, just like in this town, there's probably a lot of different St. Louis's, and they don't always overlap so well. Uh, it, it, and so New York could be a place where if you were in the wrong neighborhood and you didn't know it, you could get in trouble. So you had insular pockets, but you had this possibility for uh, more than just uh, interracial, but for interclass contact which is not an easy thing in our culture now, and there were certain things driving it in New York, and they were all kind of, on some level, a bit about vice and illegality. Uh, Times Square was this big porn hub, and it was uh, a, a lot of people met over BJ's in the, uh, in the movie theaters or whatever like that. There was a lot of mixing that way. Our neighborhood, we had a lot of drugs, and no matter if you're coming from really wealthy or really poor, I think junkies are junkies, and that's like a big weird bond, so that was going on. And then there were other kind of youth culture currents, and one was graffiti, which was really blind. I truly like, in my mind, like one of the, the great things that got over race and class perfectly. It was like you were either a good writer or a bad one, and that was crucial, and skateboarding would be the other one, I'd say. But was skateboarding, like, were people, was that as prominent a, of a, a subculture that's at that a time? Later, yeah. But that, that's another one where, sure. you know, these things break down. Sure. Yeah. Well, just my two cents is that, um, you know, anytime you have, pe I feel anytime you have people like age, you know, 18 to 25 who can work four hours a day and you know, at a lunch shift on a restaurant from 11 to 3, and then have all this free time and pay $60 a month rent, and have many, many other people just like that around them. Then you add in rock and roll, you add in hip hop, or you add in people who have, are well read, who know who, you know, about, um, um, Brancusi and, and, and Frank Burroughs. Stella and Burroughs and anytime you have all those people together, something's going to happen. Something's going to jump off. Some kind of creativity is going to happen because you only have to work from 11 to 3. And so what else are you going to do all day? <laughs> make stuff. And then hang out with your friends who make stuff at night and dance and have fun. And that's what it was. 
day after day after day after day. So then you have your friends from England who come to make stuff and you know it's just crash at your apartment yeah, yeah. or people from France and they come and they talk about you know Baudelaire and you read what is Baudelaire flowers of evil or Patti Smith talking about Rambo and you read you know and and so you have all these things together and the remnants of the beats you know we're right on top of that the remnants of Sun Ra, yeah. Sun Ra you know Oh, Sunrod played there. Oh, Coltrane played well, there. Alan Ginsberg lived down the block. Yeah. Gin Ginsberg lived down the block. You'd see Burroughs on the streets. You'd... That was just a shaker, a mixer for like, you know, a beautiful explosion, you know, yeah. Were you aware of what a beautiful explosion it was while you were living in it? Or has hindsight kind of painted it? Oh, in a... it I think me? Well, all of you, all yeah. All of us, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know. Some... <laughs> Some people knew who, but I, you know, was from Detroit and, you know, I knew the music stuff, but I certainly didn't know the literary history or the visual arts history. So, I mean, hindsight has definitely, you know, Allen Ginsberg, okay, he's cool, yeah, he played, he played with the Beatles, yeah, he went to India, also did a whole lot of other stuff <laughs> and <laughs> before that, but I, I didn't know it at the time, of course, I know it now. So can you talk a little bit about um, the kind of alternative art space? I mean, that's the term that we use now. I'm sure that it probably wasn't called that uh, at the time. But there were all of these kind of, let's say, more unusual sites and venues that you guys would frequent. Um, just kind of, it seems like it was just part of your lifestyle. Um, you know, galleries that were started in someone's bathroom or, you know, um, uh, Fab Five Freddy, who curated a show at the Mud, was it Mud Club or Club 57? Mud Club, Mud yeah. Club, right? Like, that there are all of these kind of off, off the, let's say, more unconventional spaces for seeing art. Um, can you talk a little bit about the origins, maybe, of some of that, or whether that was unusual at the time, or it felt really natural? It felt, for me, it felt organic. It was like going to a club that, that you could hear opera with Klaus Nomi, and then you could hear hip hop, and and there can there would be art on the walls, and it was it was it seemed all together at that time, mm -hmm. and and then galleries were opening up, and there was always music. I and mean, we we were uh, commenting the other uh, last last night. Oh, you know, there's no music at gal, you know, but that's mm -hmm. common. But at that time, there would be a boombox and there'd be music going on, you know? I don't know that people under the age of 40 know what a boombox is. You <laughs> might need to explain that to them. <laughs> well, back in the day, everybody before, okay, before, before there the were iPod. headphones, <laughs> we shared our music and, and nobody had a headphone on at that time. People walked around with the various sizes, of course. Uh, their own personal music. I had one. I know Felice had one. John had one, and everybody walked around with their music, and it was blaring, and it was that was what it was. And when they were talking to themselves, they really were talking to themselves. They weren't on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, I sorry. I, I just wanted to, uh, to you know, just. Uh, as the amateur historian up here, just, just to situate that a little bit. Uh, so alternative spaces had existed, and they were a great kind of thing that emerged in the 70s, back when the federal government actually believed in subsidizing the arts. And there was a whole lot of stuff with the NEA, and they really did support. And a whole lot of stuff like the collab generation could some, get some money. And a lot of great things could happen out of that, including a little bit like the Times Square show, which was uh, one of the real launching points for Jean-Michel's career. So that happened, but by the time we were doing what we were doing, that money had kind of already started to dry up. And so, and you have to remember that like, that, that also that like Jean-Michel, Keith Haring, they're, they're kind of part, uh, Kenny Scharf, uh, they were part of this generation which was a real kind of change, sea change in the art world. Because before, you didn't really look at younger artists. Like they would go to a gallery and the gallery would say, very interesting, you know, come back in five years. And it would kind of go on for a while because you really weren't taken seriously until you were like at least a mid-career artist. So it's totally changed now. Now, now mid-career is like, you know, 
the suicidal trying to pass through the eye of the needle of history so you can live on something better than cat food as an old person. Um, <laughs> but so we had no support in the, none of these artists had any support in the galleries, right? So everything from, I mean, I remember like uh, you, you mentioned the bathroom show. That was mm -hmm. this, uh, art, uh, this former artist turned dealer who um, to, had the audacity to call herself Gracie Mansion, which is the name of the mayor's mansion. So she created the, the Lou Division, which was literally a, a, her first gallery. Oh, no, her first one was actually she would park a limousine on the streets of West Broadway, then the big art district, and try to sell art out of the trunk. Uh, you know, so we didn't really know any of us what we were doing. I remember her saying one time, though, oh, I would have opened an alternative space, but I couldn't be bothered with all the paperwork. And so that was going on as well. So what was commercial was really just like a lack of careerism. So all these things, like especially the clubs, like Club 57 and Mud Club were these two clubs where everyone hung out. They, they, had, they put on really substantial, important shows that were real game changers. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was just because there was no other opportunity. So right. it was the real like, Create, you're kind we of got a barn in the backyard, let's put on yeah. a show. <laughs> um, can we get back to a little bit of, you've mentioned some of the clubs and the places where you would dance and listen to music and different kinds of music would be performed in uh, these different venues, but um, I'd like to bring music back a little bit to the exhibition and to Jean, and I know Alexis that that was one of, and Felice as well, like that was one of your strongest connections with him was through music. Um, and some, of the, uh, some in the audience may know about uh, you know, how music kind of has always played a role, I would say, in his, in his art. It has a presence, a tangible presence. Sometimes he's directly quoting, you know, Charles I is obviously Charlie Parker and, and jazz and a, kind of a whole slew of musical genres, I think, uh, come out in his work. But at this time, when you guys were all close, living together, he was in a band, he, I mean, it was a noise band. It was, uh, it was, you know, he's making music, you're listening to me. Can you just talk about the role that music kind of played, maybe holistically, but then also maybe specifically as well? Uh, okay, well, <laughs> uh, just, is, is Charlie Parker from St. Louis? Kansas City. Oh, Kansas City, okay, okay. But, um, in Kansas City is in Missouri, right? Is, is, is that near here? Other side of the state. Oh, the other side of the state. Okay, no, I was just wondering. Yeah, sorry. My geography sucks. Anyway, um, uh, well, you know, at that time, I, you know, I was trying to play music, you know, but I was trying to play music seriously, so you know, you, you know, practice, you know, two different records and stuff. And Jean, Jean was my friend or whatever, and he'd say, oh, why don't you come jam with us, you know? And I'd be like, okay, you know, and I, I got up there and, uh, you know, they were, they were making noise, you know? It was like Michael was banging on something and Shannon was blowing and Jean was on his clarinet. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, you guys aren't serious, you know, and so, because they weren't playing scales and notes, you know, and I didn't, didn't realize, well, there's something very hip happening here, too, but I was, like, on my path of, like, trying to learn scales and notes. So I didn't take Jean seri them seriously. The, oh, they're just making noise. But now, of course, I see, like, what, what he was doing and what they were doing was really, really, really hip and very, very, very... Uh, conceptual and very unique, you know. So uh, music was a huge part of what we did. The bass was a huge part. I don't know if any fans of reggae music out there, or certainly hip hop with the loud bass is a very therapeutic thing, and that united all of us. You know, you, your stereo, you had the bass up to 11, you know, you had to, <laughs> you know, and the loudness up to 11. So that was the most, the most important thing. <laughs> was the bass, you know, and, uh, you yeah, know. Big he, speakers. Big speakers, <laughs> yeah. But then there's another side of him, too, because he loved Frank Sinatra, you know, and he loved cool jazz. So um, he was just, you know, he just lived and loved music. I never really saw him without 
a, a record's going or it, it just fed his soul, I guess. All, you know? all of our soul. All I mean, we really souls. lived with music all the time yeah. without question. And the clubs were central to that. I mean, yeah. you really heard new music at the clubs. I'm, uh, I hate to sound like a cranky old man, but I find it funny when I go to clubs now and I'm hearing the same music yeah. I heard <laughs> when I was a kid. But uh, it was really, I mean, I think it's interesting, uh, Jean-Michel's such a good cipher to understand any to our time, but uh, there was so much hybridity is kind of what I remember because we've all divided up like that, you know, punk was punk and hip hop was hip hop. and. There was actually so much cross-pollination over, over music then. I mean, you had Futura making a record with The Clash. You had all this kind of uh, odd, you know, odd hybridities. And, and, and we had like this sense of what was developing in the nightclubs by, the, by really adventurous DJs. Yes. Uh, with really what we call Catholic tastes, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixing just impossible things from the past, from the present, like, from all, uh, you know, from disco to avant-garde to, to, to rock to noise to, to old show tunes. I mean, there was this so, so much and that way. So yeah, we that, had, that and, created this yeah. kind of thing. And I think Jean-Michel embraced all that. And there, there is this really interesting arc of his taste that you can trace mm -hmm. in, in his work. So when we're looking at these early pieces, you can really see somebody who's kind of like really into rock and specifically noise and like really aggressive, uh, you know, kind of vanguard gestures. And then as you see his work develop, like, I mean, there's this moment of like, his kind of hip hop moment, because he's hanging out with Fred. He's like, you know, getting turned on to all that stuff. People like Africa Mabata are coming da down and DJing at Mud Club. We're getting like, you know, the downtown really embraced uptown. In a, um, in a way that kind of shocked the uptown people. They're like, oh, okay, these kids are kind of cool. They, they like what we're doing. Uh, and, and then he did that, rec he produced this record with Ram LZ, who was uh, at that time a friend of his, uh, Beat Bop, which and is- And a graffiti writer. And a gr he had Just come out case. of graffiti as well, but was one of the first like kind of foundational hip hop singles, Beat Bop, and it's like pure freestyle. It's like really wild and you can get his, sense of what they shared in terms of the way Basquiat loved language play, and then more and more towards jazz. And it's sort of like interesting, it's sort of like when you come across the weird, obscure late recordings of Hendrix, you can kind of see where he was going outside of art and what he might have turned into, which would probably would have been a jazz cat as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that like his taste evolved, it educated itself. I mean, he was an autodidact in so many ways. He learned so much as like, because he was one of the most curious, engaged people in our culture. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can see his musical evolution in his art. It's kind of beautiful. Absolutely. It parallels in a sense. But I think there's also some of the approaches to, his, to that very hybridity that you talk yeah. about within music speaks to the, the hybridity, let's say, of all of the, his like, kind of creative interests, yeah. writing, painting, drawing, music that all of these things, performance, that all of these things fed him clearly um, and yielded incredible results. Um, and, you know, this exhibition kind of gives it a taste of yeah. some of, of some of all, you know, those multi multiple kind of and, interests. And, and there was more permission then. It wasn't, everything wasn't so professionalized. So you really did have painters forming bands. And you really did have, you know, you had everyone kind of doing everyone else's stuff. And it wasn't like, I am a this. And I think you can see that migratory aspect in him and, and how all these different scenes fed each other. Absolutely. Sorry, I'll, I'll stop you. No, you're, don't stop. <laughs> you're amazing. Right. And, and again, to the hip hop scene, it, the, the melding of the music, we had uh, people, uh, there had always been a Caribbean aspect of to New York, but Jamaicans were coming and bringing reggae music and to the downtown scene. And Af we were exposed to African music, uh, Afrobeat, um, Fela Kuti, and that was mm -hmm. also part yeah. of the experience. And because it also was coming back over from England because they, yes. they stole punk rock from us. And, uh, but you have like, uh, like in 1980s when Bob Marley moves to London, mm -hmm. right, to start making all those great records we all know by heart, like for Island. 
and like and he's integrating and with like Don Letts and that mm -hmm. whole so we're getting it like from all sides and then we had like you talk about the you know we had this kind of Afro Cuban jazz this Latino music the salsa we had all those guys still around the neighborhood yes. and then we had this also this these mutant versions of it like with Kid Creole and the Coconuts which was a band we all loved including Jean Michel and you get to see them a bit if you ever get to see that movie Downtown 81. Right, there there are outtakes of it in yeah. the exhibition, cool. and you can um, try and find it on YouTube or perhaps some other outlet. It's a little bit obscure, but Downtown 81. Were you involved in Downtown 81 no. at all in the making no. of it? They're just friends. It's a film that's a kind of fictionalized account that, in many ways, is a document of the East Village kind of cultural scene. At, you know, in the early 80s, and Jean-Michel stars as a kind of down-on-his-luck artist who gets kicked out of his apartment. <laughs> anyway, um, what I... That was a stretch. <laughs> uh, and then Debbie Harry is the fairy godmother at the end. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, so I think one thing that I wanted to talk about, if you guys can weigh into, because um, I'm not sure that Jean was necessarily unique in this sense, but it's something that he's been, like lionized for is his kind of bridging of high art and popular culture. Um, and part of that comes from these early, you know, episodes of just pulling and, you know, culling things from the street and um, very much observing what was happening on the street and kind of incorporating that back into his art. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it wasn't that a lot of people were kind of operating in that manner. Um, but my sense is that it was. Um, but maybe just speak a little bit about that kind of high-low um, approach. Well, I mean, I think, well, just one thing real quick, and I'd be curious what they have to say, uh, Alexis and Felice as well, but I, it's, it's kind of like uh, the elephant in the room we don't like to talk about but, so much, but Warhol was a huge influence on our generation. Um, and uh, just because of all the different mythologies around it. I think a lot of people who came to New York kind of came with like the factory in mind and stuff like that. And, and you can see you have one of the collaborations uh, that Jean-Michel did with Warhol, yes. which is from a collector uh, ba based out here, from a collection out here. But uh, Warhol at that time was also like kind of passe. His work had really gone downhill, no one cared. And it was very much the affections of, of Jean-Michel and Keith Haring and Kenny and George Condo and people like that that kind of brought him back. So both things go. So I do think that like a, the, a lot of the permission mm -hmm. to, uh, to just you know kind of use anything you wanted out of the culture that spoke to you and could speak for you was already allowed. And then maybe by the time it got to us, it was so allowed that it wasn't uh, it was no longer a kind of disruptive gesture in the museum. It was something that could be a lot more personal. So that, um, yeah. that these, these signs he's grabbing and these, these kind of vernaculars and styles, he's doing in really personal ways. And I think that's why they work. It's not just post-pop art. It's like, because I think everyone can get really moved by the, the directness and the honesty of the work. So go ahead, though. Please. Uh. Um, well, not much to say on that point because I don't have a depth of knowledge of art history or anything like that, but I, you know, especially in that period when we were hanging out with him a lot, you know, he, he was a kid. He was like 20, you know, or 19. And uh, so, you know, grape jelly, yeah, you know, that's very much him, you know. Uh, Twinkies, Doritos, you know, comic books. Because he was 18. He, he wasn't mm -hmm. Jean-Michel Basquiat, the famous artist, yet. You know, he was a, a kid. And so a lot of Alexis' pictures of him with a, uh, the football helmet looking in there. I mean, that, that it's, it has a childlike quality to it because that's... A youthful energy. A youthful, a youthful <laughs> energy. Yeah, because that's who he, he was. He, and hopefully... Most artists and people work very hard to maintain that yes. as they, they go through, through the years. But he was taking things from his childhood and putting them on, on paper or in sketchbooks. Or, you know, so he, you know, he, he, 
But he, he was studying that, too. Oh, he was. But I'm just saying he incorporated. He like fed off everything. So yeah. if he was in my living room and he walked across the living room floor with you know just uh, footprints on the floor, and I come home from work and there'd be a whole mess and drawing stuff everywhere, you know. And I'd be just like, man, wow, you know. I worked all day and here I come home to this. What the heck, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but then, like, whatever was around him, including Alexis's books on embryology and science or someone's record, that would have, like, found its way in a weird way onto whatever he was doing, mm -hmm. whatever artwork thing he was doing. So he just really fed on, on like, you know, <laughs> Like, like Pigpen from Charlie, Charlie Brown, who had that cloud of stuff all around him. <laughs> you know, that was like Jean, you know, he was just picking like a cloud of picking up everything, you know, radiators and what's his name, Duchamp and whatever. He was just picking it all up and like putting it back out on the page and hip hop and what's it, I'm light skinned, I live in Queens, you know, that went like putting it right on the paper, you know, everything. So yeah, and his father and, you know, so, yeah. yeah. I wanted to talk about, um, there's a work uh, that was originally your bathroom door that he painted on, and it's unfortunately not in the exhibition, but um, at the bottom of it, he wrote famous Negro athletes. It's the, an image of it is on the, the slideshow. Um, but, you know, we talked about how he has a, a couple of well-known paintings that mention Charles I, which is a reference to Charlie Parker. Uh, another one mentions Aaron, um, Hank Aaron. I think that he had a, a pretty, like, explicit interest in highlighting his heroes um, or in high and in putting his heroes out front and center in his work. Um, do you, did you, I don't know, did you feel at the time when he was making, like for example, when he was you know making when he made the door? I mean, did that feel like a kind of radical gesture? Did it feel completely consistent with the other work that he had made? Um, just I don't know. Just can you talk a little bit about inserting these black male figures who were his heroes out into his art in a manner that they really hadn't been, I would say, kind of highlighted prior to that. Uh, I'll, I'll try know. while you put because I know Alexis will have good things to say. I mean, for me, I never talked to him about it, so now this is just me, the like the rest of us, second guessing. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting as much who he didn't paint as who he did. So yeah, they're they're all uh, black men, which is you know an easy thing for us to talk about. But first of all, they're all men, right? So times have changed. But, uh, but there's no politicians. There's no literary figures. There's a whole lot of incredible contributions that are made to our culture from the African American community, and he's very specific. It's his music and sports. Uh, so that has a lot to do with heroism. It also has a lot to do, I think, and, but this is really just me, uh, and, I, and I could be totally wrong, but about the status within the culture, which is, prominent but not fully ratified. There's always a bit of a, an outsider thing. We can see it playing out now with the NFL and the NBA versus like some of the politics now. Is it like, yeah, but you're just an entertainer. You, you, know, you shouldn't speak for your community who are, you're also supposed to be a role model for. So, I mean, I think that he, he got a sense, and of course the jazz people, it's like he's going for very tragic figures as well. And, and so, it's kind of interesting as much as like who he leaves out. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has any answers to it, but uh, to me, it, it always struck me that he, it was a, it was, um, it was, you know, a very out front focus, but a very specific one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to defer to you. You defer to me. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it just. As um, I'm obviously not African American or Black or Caribbean American, but he uh, at that time, as I'm, as it continues today, there's racism. It's it's there, and um, at that time, if, if you went out to, if Jean went out to get a cab, no cab would stop for him. 
just because he's at black. And, um, you know, today, I mean, we, we were gonna talk about a, a friend from our community who was um, murdered by the, uh, the police um, in the early 80s, Michael Stewart, but that is just, he is sadly just one of many, as you know, in your own community, um, of black males who are, are you know, prejudiced, prejudice against them, the whole society seems to be. And so Jean was dealing with that, like on a day-to-day -day regular type of basis, like just going out onto the street. But he was also dealing with that in the art community, you know, and as he, as his rise to, you know, recognition and fame, he was constantly dealing with this racism. I'll just call it what it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, well, it, you know, maybe he liked sports, you know, Miles liked sports, right? Miles was always doing boxing and stuff like that. Uh, I saw an interview with Jean once on, it's probably on YouTube, where he said, you know, he put so uh, many black people into his paintings because no one, not many other people are doing that and people don't tend to notice these people, and they just skip right on by, you know, and uh, so he wanted to illuminate, you know, black people, and, and that's what he wanted to do in his work, and uh, get people noticed, you know, that people just look over, oh, there's the cleaning lady, oh, there's the person bringing my coffee, you don't even see them, do you? It's just, you know, so that's Jean, wanted to give life to the people who are, are not really seen. That's what I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, you know, the athletes, I don't know. I mean, I, didn't, I, I, I don't know why he was using those people a lot. Um, to what extent it, um, has the kind of myth of Jean-Michel Basquiat kind of eclipsed the, the real, let's say, <laughs> Jean, whom you knew and lived with and were friends with during his short life. I will always hold on to that real person and be enormously proud of everything that he did. When you look and you see, they say he did a thousand paintings in like 10 years, and you see the beautiful paintings and how, how, how much celebration he's gotten you know, he always used to say, oh, I'm gonna be a famous artist, I'm gonna be well known, I'm gonna be famous, and he was like a, my little brother, and I'd be, okay, John, okay, good, you know, cool. I didn't really, you know, it's like, that's great. I'm just so, pr so proud of what he's done and what he continues to do with his sa the same O of Al Diaz and many, uh, I'm just so proud of him you know, as, as uh, what he achieved. It's just wonderful, really. And so I'm always uh, just so proud of him. And how he's inspiring. Um, part of the reason I got involved in this project of, of sharing this work um, that you'll see in the gallery next door is that I went to a panel and, uh, at the New School with my son who was attending there and it was Al Diaz, who's here in the audience, where we'll be shouting out to him. Original Samo. Yes. And. Yeah. And uh, it was also, and Michael Holman, who's not here, who's part of our uh, crew, and a gallerist, Anina Nose, and it was uh, like this, hundreds of people, young, young people, hungry for, any morsel of knowledge about Jean. And I'm like, wow, here we, ha you know, this is, this is really interesting that all these young people, I've seen, you know, various ages out there, but a lot of young people who are stimulated by this uh, artist. And, and it was, I felt it was important for us who knew him to share our, you know, our knowledge and how it was with, 
you know, with uh, at this point because there is I, I don't know if there's a resurgence or it's or it's just a growing acknowledgement of his art and his life and and I feel honored to be part of of this. Yeah. I think certainly the commercial success of Basiat's um, you know contributions to kind of the history of art to contemporary art to contemporary culture have um, immensely. Um, expanded and grown interest in his life and his work and I think that um, I think that in many ways that was something that happened to him during his lifetime that uh, maybe made things a little bit more complicated um, that the commercial world kind of celebrated him and threw so much at him so quickly and so young um, and the kind of museum world was a little bit slower to catch up. Um, and s in some ways, the work that we're doing by showing all of this work is to make clear that this was an, a singular artist with a rapacious mind and appetite and curious um, kind of co creative approach to art making where everything was could be possibly included into what he was doing and what he was making. Um, I wanna kind of just take a step back because I think I take for granted, Alexis, that I know the story of how all of this work kind of was ushered out into the world. Um, but I think the audience would greatly enjoy hearing about how you kind of, you know, were such a guardian of this work over many years and how uh, you ultimately decided to kind of make it available and share it with the world. You don't have to talk about Christie. Okay. So, uh, like I said, after I saw that uh, panel at the New School, um, every year prior to that, somebody would approach me with an inquiry about John, and then um, about around that time, uh, sort of people, more people became aware of, of what I had at my apartment, which was about a half dozen, maybe 10 different um, items from the, the collection um, framed in my house or the bathroom door, which was no longer the, on the bathroom <laughs> door, was, was placed on the wall. Um, and uh, so with the growing interest, I realized I had to do something. So with the help of friends, um, and people that I've met along the way. Um, I have, including yourself, uh, have gathered, uh, you know, those items along with, um, I had a safety deposit box with a, lo a lot of the writing and the um, notebook and some of the other um, items that you'll see here. And I had not gone to the safety deposit box in 25 years. And then uh, we had Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and I started thinking about the safety deposit box because it was in the basement of a bank a, a few blocks from where I live and where we live, which was all flooded. And so um, I also worked at um, New York uh, University Hospital, which lost power and was also flooded and it was a very busy time. But by the end of the year, I was able to get to that box and I opened it up and things had sort of melded together. I had forgotten what was there. And then I realized I really had a treasure trove. And so I started showing it to various people and, and people started getting excited and, and that's how it started. <laughs> I think it's just such a um, kind of, the word that comes to mind is like human, you know, kind of a tender um, story of just taking care of it over so many years, knowing that it was special, but then having this moment of rediscovery. And, you know, that's what so many people have, that moment of awe and wonder and curiosity being piqued is what visitors experience as they go through the exhibition and they start to read some of his writings and you just have this sense of you know his 
his brilliance um, as a wordsmith, you know, and his facility with language and all of these things that, you know, you maybe had a hint of, but you'd never necessarily witness firsthand. Um, and that is a huge gift to the world that you have allowed all of us to share in. And it's extraordinary and it, it's, it's humble. I mean, you, it's not like, you know, you, you made it difficult or anything. You realize that you had all of this and you said, okay, it's time for the world to see this because there's such interest and um, fascination with this artist kind of at the mythic level and you've brought him down to earth in a way that's so meaningful and intimate. Sorry, Felice, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, huh? oh I didn't know if you wanted to no, no. say anything. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, I wonder if maybe we could take it, um, a few questions from the I audience. I just want to say one thing. Oh, yes, of course. I, I didn't yeah, you did want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just, uh, I forget where we were a minute ago uh, talking about um, him as an artist. But I just want to say, the main thing about John, one thing about him that's so important is that he believed in himself. You know, you had the art world people, you know, uh, say that a painter, a painter looks like this. And you see, you know, Leonardo da Vinci or you see Goya or you see someone and it's usually a, a white male person and that's what a painter looks like, and that's who goes to art school, and that's what it looks like. And he said, I'm a painter, I'm, a great, I'm going to be a great painter. That was a revolutionary statement for a black man to say in 1979. Trust me, trust me. You know, and he, he believed in himself. He got fired from Foot Locker. He, he, he came home. He came home. You know, I said, what happened? I got fired. OK, I'm going to be a great painter. OK, you know, he's walking on the street with Doritos. Al, you know, and whatever. I'm going to be a great painter. He's on the, you know, graffitiing something somewhere. Why? because I'm going to be a great painter and you're going to know me someday. And he constantly said that inside himself. And it's very important, especially for the young people and especially for the young black people to understand that, that he believed in himself and he would not let them shoot him down. Okay? For real. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think we can. Uh, can I just I'm suggest sorry. one <laughs> one thing as a question? I mean, because you brought up all the wordsmithing, and I yeah. think it's really crucial. I mean, I think that's part of your notebooks, and there were some other notebooks which came to light, and basically, and then we started reading the text in his paintings, and everyone started really appreciating him as much as a as a great wordsmith, as Absolutely. you said, and the kind of poetic, uh, the lyricism, the abstraction, and all that stuff he did like that. And I think it's interesting because part of that came from, from hip hop, right? Like from the uh, beginning of rap and also the lyrics of, of you know, regular uh, rock music. And then also from graffiti, which was a moment where we started really looking at the language and the text and stuff like that. And if we can ask the first kind of question to come from Al, because Al Diaz, who is here, and we're really celebrating that fact because he's got a show opening tonight yes. in town, is uh, he was the, the the, the co-collaborator on SEMA, which was the, the project they did together for a number of years on the street. And Al's got the same kind of like funny sense of, of humor and language, and that's very much like the way yeah. kids snap on each other in the playgrounds and stuff. You know, it's, it's kind of like an urban, you know, vernacular, so maybe the first thing Absolutely, can come. Absolutely, yes. You got anything to say about this young man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Without getting into the convoluted history of Samo, which I'll save for later. Um, hi. Can't see you okay. Uh, Do you want to stand up? Yeah, Al? I'm sorry. The main, the, the one thing that we, me and Jean did together that was like completely revolutionary. Now that I think about it, or in retrospect rather, because while you're doing it, you're not thinking, oh, we're going to make history. Uh, was that 
we took well, a movement, a graffiti was essentially your name and a number that was somehow relevant to your either where you lived or something, but it was a number. And it was all about self, it was just purely a signature. You were writing Stay High 149, Futura 2, whatever your n name was, because you were there. What we did was, Samo was not a, pers a persona, it was a product. And it was a, a, a vehicle for us to express just that, like us making fun of the world around us. And that was completely different. And we had no idea that we were, what we were doing. It's only in retrospect that I see, that I understand what it is that we were doing. And I could not have done that without someone to bounce off of, like Jean-Michel, who was, I mean, there you go, there, Popeye died of syphilis. I couldn't do that by myself. So, <laughs> um, it's, 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 you know, it's a, it's a wonderful collaboration and it's probably one of the, you know, my, greatest accomplishments in, in life and I'm still doing it because it was, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that, I, that, that, that me and him work, you know, that I was able to work with Jean-Michel. He was, I wanted to, to, to throw him out the window sometimes. So I, I don't have that, I don't have that blind mythology that, you know, oh, Saint Jean-Michel, no, he was my friend. So, you know, so I understood him and there were times, he was my peer. So, um, but that's so one much, of, that's Al. probably one of the, the the, the greatest thing, and it, it has everything to do with what you're saying about his, his uh, wordsmith, and he was, he was, uh, he was, he would make me want to up my game, because Jean was brilliant, and he didn't, he never, he probably never completed any, any book or anything in his life. First of all, he was a high school uh, dropout. He got, he got thrown out of high school, so they, that goes to show what you can do without a high school diploma. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, it was, he, he, he I, 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 he was, a, he was a, a force to contend with. I had to, you know, I had to keep my game up high with him. Thanks. Thank you so much, Al. <laughs> yeah, just to that point, he would call any, uh, like as a roommate or just friend, whatever, lover, he would, any, fault that he would see, he would call it out right away, right? All the, all the time. Uh, okay, are we ready to open yes, it up? Yes, okay, yeah. all right. This point. Sorry, um, <laughs> all right, there's the question up here. Your experiences is, is for the ladies, um, and Felice in particular, I love the comment you made about him believing in himself because um, I was born a year after him, or excuse me, a year before, so I'm, I'm familiar with the era. But about his work, I don't, I love how he desperately loves the black man. I love how he expresses the way he moved through the world, the way he saw things around him. I, 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 and it is so relevant today because even if you take, you know, Al, uh, same old, you know, same old, same old. We're looking at that today in 2018. You know, we're looking at the same old, same old. You know, and to be at that point, to be able to express that through his personality, through your personalities, you know, and in his all of his work, how he loves the black man. How much do I love that? Because when I look at it, I'm moved by his humanity. I'm moved by his love of self, and he's going through the world as himself. So for the two of you ladies who, who were roommates and friends, it, like that must have really been a crazy wild ride in the 70s and early 80s to be with this dynamic, young, black man who refused to be anything other than what he was. So I just want to say thank you, ladies, for sharing your experiences. And if you could say one or two little things about that, too, that would be helpful for me. Anybody out here got a little brother who doesn't wash the dishes or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody out here got that person in their life, you know? So not so different than that, you know. Uh, yes, he was dynamic, but as Al said, he, for me, he's not St. Jean. He was, uh, you know, what was, I, I don't know. He just had a lot of energy. He was really funny. And also, besides believing in himself, he worked constantly. He didn't just say, I'm going to be a famous artist. No. He worked constantly, 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 constantly. 
had fun, 24 /7. slept, worked, 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 worked. That's so, so, but you know, he, uh, it was, he was just, he was a cool person. If you talk to Al afterwards, you'll see they're very similar in a lot of ways. And another guy named Shannon, who uh, you know is not here today, they have a very, s not here in St. Louis today, they have a very similar uh, sense of humor and thing. So that, th you know, it's like a New York street thing, but I, I, I was happy to know him. I was really happy to know him, you know. And he was, a, th you know, well, he was a friend, so I liked him. Hello, how you doing? Hey, good. Hello, how you doing? Um, so knowing all the success John has had or his work has had commercially, um, you know, that knife kind of cuts both ways. And so you see things like Basquiat boxer shorts and, and um, skis <laughs> and socks and stuff. How do you think John would have felt about his work in that way? <laughs> well, he was into the, there was a branding aspect with the C, he was like an early brand. Totally. Yeah. Part, of, part of it. He often, just for those who might not know, he would often, uh, with Al, they would sign Samo with a copyright symbol next to it. However, he took his art very seriously, and I'm not sure, I don't know, like Felice says, we cannot know, how he'd feel about that. But I dare say that he f feels better that his paintings are in museums than people are wearing them as underwear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do think, uh, yeah, and I agree with what you're saying, but I do think we, there was a real populist tendency, and, and that's why you would do work on the street instead of like for the galleries or the museums because you wanted to reach everyone, and I think, you know, well, mixed Pete. in with his ambitions, there'd be a lot of the stuff he'd like. It's complicated with the states because basically they don't have the work to sell anymore, so it's all about licensing and, and stuff like that. But there's, there's some things I think he would genuinely wince or, or, or maybe even roll over in his grave over. But I think as a general tendency, he wouldn't be totally upset. Is that fair to say? You hard to say. Hard we shouldn't say. speak for him. <laughs> Uh, question back there, yes. Can you talk a little bit about the crown? And I've heard different stories about the, the three points, why some picture or paintings, excuse me, have the crown, others don't, sure. uh, where that came from. I mean, it, uh, Carla, I'm gonna pass it to you mostly, but it, it's a symbol that recurs throughout his work, and it, um, but it is also a symbol from graffiti. Right. Um, symbol, power, confidence, ego, sovereignty, I mean, all of those very obvious, and it is something that he would use throughout, you know, it's present in, in the notebook, it's present uh, on the sculpture milk, he signed it with just a crown. Um, the three points on top recur as the kind of jagged lines of a smile in another painting. I mean, it's part of his visual vocabulary, but, it's a sim but it derives primarily from graffiti. I'll let Carlo shed a little more light on that. Yeah, and maybe Al would be is even more of an expert than me. Uh, you, you basically nailed it. Uh, it does exist. It is like this idea of the king, like you could be a king of a line or something like that. There was this kind of uh, royalty that existed <laughs> in the masters and the, uh, and the, and the legends of graffiti, so, but he owned it. You know, he took it and he owned it, and uh, it's, it's all his uh, for whatever other history it has. And, he, and as you say, he... He developed it uh, also as a language, not po after graffiti, uh, about like like an idea of like a uh, an African king or something like that. It, 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 it takes on all these other kind of signifiers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. you got anything to add to that, Al? What did I miss? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The crown is a big thing. The crown goes back. It's it, first of all, it's part of street lore, and although we have given him ownership of the crown, I don't think Jean appropriated that ownership. He used it as part of his lexicon. It's like, okay, gang members will have, who, have, who are not anti-Semitic will have a, a little swat stick, a homemade tattoo on their arm because it means tough, you know? Mm -hmm. But they don't see the, the, the other connotations that it has. It's just part of a street language. Mm -hmm. The crown is just that. It's like 
a skelly board or any, a star, any number of symbols that becomes associated with street culture. And he was, that's, that's the way he, he would read all that stuff and use it in his work. Mm -hmm. So the, but he, but the crown was, I guess he had a certain affinity for that and it became uh, prevalent in his work. Sure. But once again, I mean, the Latin kings were using that crown, rat, K-161, yeah. early guys in, uh, who started writing graffiti in 1969, right. first generation, were using the Coco 144, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. They all used the crown. He took it and he made it his, but it's his crown that he used, that, that pointy three, three, you know? But it's, it's, once again, he had an eye for all this stuff around him. Mm -hmm. And he, and, the, and, and, then and, he and, 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 and yeah, and he, and he used it to, to, the, to the fullest with the crown. Awesome. Other questions? Well, oh, right here. So, so I, um, I'm not, is it on? Um, I didn't hear any references to family, and I'm wondering um, where his family is. Well, we were all sort of immigrants, well, not all of us, but we were, we, uh, I guess we were all immigrants to the, Lower East Side, the East Village, which was an immigrant community, like Carlos said. Um, down the block, there was an old church, uh, which has been torn down, that was uh, an Italian church, but was now a Puerto Rican church. And we were immigrants to, we had all left our houses. There were no cell phones. We had telephones that would, without an answering machine, we were sort of kind of cut off from our our families. I felt I felt that we were just our family was the East Village. Jean was coming from Brooklyn, so a lot. I was coming from Seattle, so it was further. But uh, he too, you know, became cut off from his family. He had sort of run away from home. I mean, later on when I had a teenage son, which. Uh, Felice also ha had, uh, our, our sons are in their 20s now. Um, uh, dealing with a teenage son was, you know, I, I kind of felt the way Sean's dad probably felt <laughs> a little bit. And, you know, it's tough having that energy. And uh, so he left his family. Um, Sometimes he'd call his sisters and we'd talk to him. He was a little concerned about them because he had a tough dad, you know. But we were not really part, of, our family were the people around us at that time, I'd say. And I think it's um, very important to note that he ran away from home and for the, like the last time basically. And when he and Alexis moved into their apartment together, that was his first permanent address in a in a long time, and so it was the first time that he can start to make work in a somewhat sustained manner, work on something over time, work on something, cover it up, redo it, do it in a different way. Um, it's kind of like a proto-studio, because um, obviously it's not like he had a separate room for a studio in their apartment. He and so did. it was this like creative, that, well his that, bedroom no, and no, the, the living middle, room, the living room was, this, was his this, studio, was and the, also your living room. But we didn't have, that was all there was. Right, no, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think art. people have a conception of an artist working in a studio yeah. that's like a completely yeah, right. protected oh separate God. space, and that wasn't the case. Um, but that's what allowed him to start to work on and work through some ideas, and it was shortly after he moved on from their apartment that he did have his first studio. And, and so this apartment was this kind of way station in between working so much on the street and then working in the studio. One more question. Um, I'd like to know what you miss most about him as a friend. Quickly. Me? Yeah. I wish that, I miss that he never got to meet my son. You know, I, I, I tell my son all the time, you know, uh, that's what I miss is that he never got to meet him. I, mean. I, you know, it's, it's, you miss, we lost a lot of people back then, at that time with um, AIDS and drugs and very, and violence, um, but, you know, it's just sad that he's not here with us, but, you know, we're, we're stepping in for him at this moment, I'd say.
you know. But with, you know, sharing our, he was a very warm and generous person, and yeah. we're just sharing his love. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Um, thank you all so much for being here. We'll obviously stick around in case there are additional questions. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, the entire staff of CAM, for being so welcoming and warm yes, and gracious. Thank you all for being here.